Question 11. Given the provided sample correlation coefficient between ETF A and ETF B is 0.5789 with 45 monthly observations, which of the following T values would result in rejecting the null hypothesis of no correlation at the 1% significance level? Use the following T table. So basically we need to figure out um, which, uh, what our critical value is going to be based on this T based on this T table and then compare that to these answers and our answer is going to have to be greater than um, the critical value in order to be um, st statistically significant. So what we need to do is figure out where on this table we're going to do, where on this table we're going to be. So first thing we'll look at, let's look at degrees of freedom. Um, we have 45 monthly observations and then we have two um, parameters, ETF A and ETF B. So we'll do 45 minus 2 to get our degrees of freedom, which is going to be 43. Um, so we'll be looking at this row here. And then for the p-value, we need to choose the um, value that corresponds with the significance level. So we've got 1% significance level. Um, this is going to be a two-sided test, though. So when it's a two-sided test, we need to take that p-value in half. So we're going to be looking at p, um, not 0.01, but p.005. So we've got 43 degrees of freedom, p.005. So this is going to be our critical value here. So are any of these numbers greater than that? A is not, B is not, and C is um, equal to it. So that's going to be our best answer there. Answer C. All right, we're looking at question 12 here. The interest rate quoted on investment can least likely be viewed as so since we're looking at least likely, this means we're going to be choosing an answer that does not reflect um, the interest rate quoted on investment. So two of these will be kind of correct assumptions, and then one will not be, and that one will be what we go with. So we've got A, the return foregone on current consumption. This um, We can rule this out since this is an accurate uh, view on the interest rate quoted. If we're consuming money now, um, that interest rate that we would be receiving as a return um, is basically our opportunity cost. So if we're using our money now, we're not going to be investing it and receiving that return. B, the maximum rate of return an investor must receive to accept an investment. Um, this sounds like it could be our answer. Uh, the maximum rate of return an investor requires isn't necessarily going to align with it, the interest rate quoted on any specific investment. Um, this is going to vary investor to investor and the interest rates quoted are going to vary um, investment to investment. Um, so while it may affect whether an, an investor decides to invest in the investment or not, it's not necessarily going to be an accurate reflection of like why this is why the interest rate is at um, the current rate that it's at. Uh, C, a sum of the nominal risk-free rate and premiums to compensate for distinct types of risk. Uh, we can also go ahead and rule this out. Synthesis is an accurate view as well. Um, to give an example, a treasury bond might be trading at four, might be trading at a 4% rate, and then a corporate bond, um, which is going to have some credit risk, so that would be a credit premium, might be trading at 5%. So it would be 100 basis points of spread there. And then another uh, example would be term premium. So uh, in a normal world where the yield curve isn't inverted, um, a one-year bond would uh, likely trade at a lower interest rate um, than a five-year bond. So we'll stick with answer B. Question 13. If in 2001, dollar euro equals 3.67, and in 2002, dollar euro equals 4.67, we can most likely say that. So before we look at these answers, let's just talk about what this means. So dollar euro is 3.67. So dollar is our price currency. Euro is our base currency. Base currency is always going to be one. And then price currency will be this number. So essentially what this is saying is it takes $3.67 to buy one euro. So then in 2002, now it takes $4.67 to buy one euro. So... But basically, it takes us more dollars to buy a euro now. So essentially what this is meaning is that the dollar has weakened or the euro has strengthened. So that's what we're going to be looking for in our answers. So dollar, um, we'll give a down arrow, and then euro strengthened. 
So we've got euro has depreciated. Nope, euro has strengthened versus USD. Dollar has depreciated. Yes, that's what we're looking for. And then C, dollar has appreciated. Uh, we can cross that off as well. Answer B. Question 14, GR Solutions offers investment plans to its clients. Howard Isaac is one of the firm's clients currently invested in GR's superior return plan. Isaac will require funds to construct a house two years from today. The plan promises to pay $380,000 six years from today. Given a 10% discount rate, the amount of, of funds Isaac should be able to accumulate for the home construction is closest to. So we're investing in this plan. Um, Isaac is requiring um, funds to construct the house two years from today. And the plan promises to pay $380,000 six years from today. So essentially, um, using this 10% discount rate, what we need to do is discount this $380,000 back six years from now back to the two-year point. So we're just going to discount back by four years. So pretty simple um, calculation there once we figure all that out. So we're going to take that 380, divide that by 1.1, uh, which is our 10% discount raised to the fourth power. Gives us uh, 259 and some change, which corresponds right there with answer B. Question 15. From the following data, 95, 54, 68, 44, 128, 129, 81, and 77, the sixth decile is closest to 79.4, 85.8, or 88.2. So for this um, calculation, we're going to be using our percentile formula, and then we may also need to be using um, interpolation to figure this out. So one of the first things we want to do is put these numbers in order so that we have that for later on. So we're going to, I just reordered these um, on the exam. You could either type it into the notes box or you could just write it out on your scrap paper. Um, so we've got those in order now. And so we have eight observations. <laughs> So then let's jump into these other formulas and walk through how to figure this out. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna use this percentile formula, which is gonna tell us where in that order um, this number, the sixth decile falls. So for this percentile formula, we're gonna have n plus one, so our n is number of observations. We've got eight, we established that. And then for sixth decile, that's going to be um, 60th percentile, essentially. So 60 divided by 100 is what we have here. So our we get 5.4. So this is telling us that the number falls uh, bet between 5 and uh, 6 on this sheet. So we've got 81 and 93. So right away, we could go ahead and cross off answer A, since it won't fall between those. Um, and then another thing to note, if this was, if this came out as six exactly, then we would know that 93 was our number. So if, we, if you get a whole number here, the question would be done. You just find the number in the order and then pick the answer. But since we have a decimal, we need to use the interpolation formula to um, figure out what the exact value is going to be. So that interpolated value is going to be the lower value. So we'll take 81, and then um, we're going to add that to the fraction, um, which is going to be 5.4 minus the lower value, so 5.4 minus 5. Um, and then multiply that by the upper value minus the lower value. So we're going to have um, 93 minus 81. So this gets multiplied first, essentially. Um, and then we are adding 81 to it, we get 85.8. Answer B. Question 16, consider the following information relating to two portfolios. Portfolios A's variance of returns is 52.5, portfolio B's variance of returns is 63%, and the covariance of return between the two portfolios is 0.315. The correlation of returns between these two portfolios is closest to so I'm going to pull in the formula for um, solving this. So our correlation is going to be um, covariance between the two, which we're given at 0.315. And then the trickier part comes in is we're going to do that divided by the standard deviation of A times the standard deviation of B. So we are given the variance um, of the two. 
Um, so we just need to convert these into standard deviations, which we're going to do by um, taking the square root, essentially. So here's what that looks like fully. So we've got our 0.315 in the numerator, which is just that covariance, and then we're going to divide that by those two um, standard deviations. So we just take the 0.525, um, square root it to get standard deviation of A, and then 0.63, square root it to get standard deviation of B, comes out to 0.5477, and we'll round that up and go with answer C. Question 17, if there is no variability in the data set, the geometric mean will most likely be equal to her arithmetic and harmonic mean, B, harmonic mean, but will be lower than arithmetic mean, or C, arithmetic mean, but it will be higher than harmonic mean. So when there's no variability in the data set, that essentially means all of our return streams are the same. And this is going to lead to an outcome where arithmetic mean, harmonic mean, and geometric mean are all the same. I'm going to pull in an example to kind of demonstrate that. Um, so with arithmetic mean, that's just going to be all our return streams added together and then divide by the number of observations. So I'm using 4 as our number here, and we'll have 3 observations. So 4 plus 4 plus 4 divided by 3 gives us 4. And then geometric mean is going to be those um, return, I guess they're not necessarily returns in this instance, but that's going to be our data, and we're going to compound it. And then we're going to um, take the nth root of that. So we have three observations, so we're going to be to the third root after multiplying out all of our data, essentially. So when we do that, we see that also gets us to four. And then harmonic mean, lastly, um, we're going to do n in the numerator and then divide that by one over all of our uh, variables. So we get three divided by one fourth plus one fourth plus one fourth also gives us four. So this is a nice way to kind of see how this works out in practice. Um, and then lastly, just another example here. So I, in this example, I just introduced very little variability. So I made one of the observations six instead of four. And when we do that, we can see our final answer ends up being um, slightly different. So we get 4.66 for arithmetic, 4.57, and 4.5 for harmonic. Question 18. The stocks returned for the past four years are as follows. 12%, 9.5%, 8%, the geometric mean return is closest to. So for geometric mean, um, we're going to be compounding these returns out. So first step here is going to be multiply, doing 1 plus each of these and then multiplying them all together. So we've got 1.12 times 1.095 uh, times 1.08 times 1.14. Uh, 1147 gives us 1.5192. So this is essentially our return over that whole period. So then to bring this number back to an annualized number, we need to take the nth root. So that's going to be um, 1 over 4. So the fourth root or raising it to 0.25 would be the same thing. And then subtract 1 to get our annualized number. So when we do that, we get 0 0.1102 or 11.02% which is going to be answer A. Question 19. Which of the following is least likely a reason for a government to impose trade restrictions? A, to protect new or infant industries. So yes, this is a reason that we would um, impose trade restrictions. Uh, if a government wants to develop a new industry by not allowing um, that industry or widget or whatever it is to come into the country will kind of force um, companies or entrepreneurs to innovate and provide that uh, internally or domestically um, for that country. So since our answer is least likely, uh, we can go ahead and cross this off since this is a reason to impose trade restrictions. B, to avoid comparative advantage over other countries. This is likely going to be our answer since there's no reason you'd want to avoid a comparative advantage. If you have a comparative advantage over other countries, that's uh, typically going to be a very big op economic opportunity for your country to produce more, um, since comparative advantage means you can produce more at a lower cost, and then export that to other countries, which is typically going to be very, very economically um, lucrative for that country. So we wouldn't want to impose a trade restriction to avoid that. Um, 
And then C, to protect goods that are crucial to a country's defense. Um, this is also a reason to impose trade restrictions. We are sitting here in March 2025, and um, kind of a current events example is you can see this happening with semiconductors in the United States and um, them not allowing certain semiconductors, the latest technology, to be exported to China. Uh, so all that said, we'll stick with B. Question 20. A company which produces 5G communication equipment has two factories, A and B. 40% of the equipment are made in factory A, 60% in factory B. It has been established that 90% of the equipment produced by factory A meets specifications while only 75% of the equipment produced by factory B meets specifications. If a telco uh, buys the equipment, the probability that it meets specifications is closest to. So in this instance, we're gonna be using the total um, probability rule since we can um, essentially invest or be buying from both factories at the same time. We're kind of splitting our production. So these are happening in parallel. So we can consider 40% um, at factory A with 90% making that. So we're basically gonna add, multiply these two numbers together and then we're gonna multiply the 60% uh, by the 75% together. And then we'll add these two together at the end, um, which here is how that works out. So we take 40% times 90%, um, which makes it uh, in factory A, meet specifications of factory A, and then 60% produced in factory B while only 75% meet specifications. Add those together, we get 0.81, which is answer C.